Nancy is going to give us a, an overview of the framework of implementation science within PEPFAR. Nancy is currently a senior technical advisor in the office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator in Washington. And the title of her talk is implementation, is implementation Science Framework Within PEPFAR. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so just by way of um, my thoughts of the day so far, is clearly I'm preaching to the converted. That is, everyone is completely on board with implementation science. And had I known that, I probably would have, well, I'll tell you what I would have done when I get to that slide. But um, I think one thing is uh, that's a useful, th sorry about that. Most of this is from a collaborative paper that I wrote with um, colleagues at OGAC, including um, Ambassador Goosby. Um, We've used the word implementation science, but we hadn't really d defined it. And um, one interesting thing is that when I was at a conference that was run by NIH on implementation science just about a month ago, there was a woman who was a Canadian researcher, I'm sorry I can't remember her name, who gave the list of terms that are all kind of operations research, implementation science, and there were dozens. And in fact, there was a really funny Canadian one, and I'm really sorry, I can't remember what it was, but anyway. But the way we defined it in the paper mm -hmm. was methods to improve the uptake, implementation, and translation of research findings into routine and common practice. You need to use methods, and this is what I should have focused on and I'll talk about a little bit more. You want to maintain the rigor of traditional biomedical research, but with better external validity. You don't want to give up research for proof of, um, that, you don't want to give up rigor because you're no longer looking at proof of concept. So we're going from efficacy and proof of concept to effectiveness while still maintaining rigor. One way that um, it's really more real world evaluations. So in many of the newer methods of evaluations for effectiveness, for example, mid-course corrections are permitted. You're allowed to peek at your outcome. And it's, it's a more, it's a programmatic way that you can inform the program while you're evaluating it. Um, Renee just uh, did a great setup. I'm not sure if she's still um, in the room or not, but um, what are the outcomes of implementation science? It's really effectiveness and efficiency. Optimal delivery, value for the money, that was the title of the last section. Uh, cost effectiveness, what's the most efficient strategies for implementation? Um, it really is a shift from a focus of does something work to how do we do it so that it works. So again, it's to transfer and adapt and scale up interventions from one setting or population to another. I think a lot of this talk this morning is that there's very tantalizing data that this is um, efficacious without a gold standard randomized controlled trial. So do we skip efficacy and go straight to effectiveness, in which case we would evaluate effectiveness as we roll it out at scale? or are there other issues? Um, other uh, strategies for um, implementation science, whether interventions are efficient, uh, I'm just repeating myself, but the bottom line is to make an informed evidence-based choice between components within a strategy or strategies for delivery. Um, this is the framework that we've adopted for PEPFAR, um, and the, I, the hope is that we then have a single framework for our entire spectrum of PEPFAR program evaluation activities. And the specific, the way we further define implementation science is it sort of gets broken down into your traditional monitoring and evaluation, operations research, and impact evaluation. Um, and the whole idea behind this, we can just skip this and go on, is really to have an overarching framework so that we're really making evidence-based policies um, and focusing on key questions for PEPFAR. Um, I, I made my own cascade. I mean, everyone's cascade crazy, but I, I, the, re the reason why I did this, and I, and I really, there's been so many excellent conversations on cascades, and I, I don't know if we have a pointer, but um, I, I think that the key, actually, for implementation science is to begin by defining your cascade, um, because that is the key to implementation. And so with tests, tr uh, seek, test, and treat, I mean, I, there are at least two cascades, if not more, and not only that, we people can do a better job of this than me. Well, you know, what does the community need to do? Um, it needs to seek, create demand, provide testing, and retain people because a really critical, well, sorry about that, I left out my punchline. My punchline is the way I see this, ca this cascade as being somewhat different from other cascades that Renee mentioned is this is a cycle. I mean, it's a cyclical cascade because the thing is, once you're tested, you have to have repeat testing if you're negative. If you're positive, depending on eligibility, you have to, you, you have to um, be linked to care, which is, of course, another cascade. So once an individual, whether they're tested or not, 
is um, um, they have to be repeatedly they have to be repeatedly tested. So are they do they have transport? Can they motivate it? Assuming we can make demand, do they get the right drug? Um, do they adhere? Then they have to go back and, and get more drug and do they adhere? And then they have to go back and get tested. So I mean I think that that's really, really one of the challenges is this repeat testing and how to sustain demand. I mean we've really heard so much about how few people really know their status. Um, I'm, I'm going to just skip right to impact evaluation, which is what I would have focused on had I. And I think this is my plea for everything that we've talked about today. You've got to evaluate. You've got to eva evaluate rigorously. What is impact evaluation? It's the methods of evaluation. It actually is a coming together of development economics, epidemiology, and biostatistics. Some of it's old, but it's really also a new and burgeoning field. There's an entire meeting, three-day meeting, devoted to impact evaluation in Cuernavaca in June. Um, but it, the whole, uh, it, it, it permits causal attribution. I think that is the fundamental thing as opposed to descriptive M&E. Um, it compares what we, uh, it, it, you compare what you're looking at, your outcome of interest to the counterfactual, what would have happened had the program not taken place. Um, it can examine the impact or, or the ultimate impact of interest, which is effectiveness. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about um, what, it, do you have to go so far as to look at infections averted? Is it good enough to look at viral load? Um, but I, I think it is critical. I mean, that part of impact evaluation is methodological, but it's also that you have to look at the ultimate impact of interest. Um, methods of impact evaluation can also be used to assess interim outcomes in addition to your ultimate outcome of, of interest. And I'm just repeating myself here about different strategies for delivery. But if you go back and look at the cascade, whoops, there's, there's um, a node. You can use the methods of impact evaluation to evaluate each node along the cascade. Um, so just really quickly, um, so, and I, I, I know Kevin's going to talk about priorities, but um, some implementation science framework questions, if you look back at um, monitoring and evaluation, which is a component of it, you might want to look at what is the most effective, what should the frequency of testing be? What should the nature of counseling be? You know, do you have enough test kits and sites? Um, what about reach and target? I think creation of demand is a huge thing that we really haven't talked much about today. Um, and again, you need to be continuously in this, in this cycle. Um, and then, uh, as part of your monitoring and evaluation, you can also be looking at these interim outcomes, but again, you can ratchet it up and use some of the more rigorous methods of impact evaluation. Um, operations research for this um, is really the same as operations research for any, any kind of um, program. Delivery challenges and bottlenecks, I don't think we need to go for that, but what you're looking for is the op op optimal allocation of resources for the program. And here, are just to close with some specific IS uh, questions that were related to this. What, I mean, uh, the other thing I find if you're trying to define things, if you use the word optimize a lot, then people think, I got it. But anyway, what are the best ways to optimize service delivery? What are the most, and by that, we really mean cost effective. So you could look at fixed versus mobile clinics, task shifting as part of, specifically as part of treat to prevent. Should this be done in vertical or integrated programs? How do we prove access to the programs? Whom to target? What are the best methods to identify those who are eligible? And again, you have to have ongoing screening. It's not a one-off. Can you create demand? There was some interesting talk. I'm very smitten by incentives. Um, Wafa um, brought that up this morning in her study. I mean, is that a way to create and sustain demand? Should you give incentives to providers for them to go out and get people so it can go both ways? Um, we, and are there ways to um, do that to innovative ways to increase adherence and reten retention? Um, and then finally, just a note on combination prevention. Um, I think the other issue that has to be evaluated rigorously is how we optimize or amplify the impact of treatment for prevention. And the fact is, in the real world, once we go out and do this, it's never going to be done alone. There are going to be other interventions that are going on in the community. So what is the optimal combination of strategies to enhance the benefit of this and with regard to prevention and also what is the way to make a smooth transition to care and treatment. Thanks.